Um, we'll kind of go through just the basics, kind of what, what I've done, um, where I've been, that sort of thing, and then kind of go through some different aspects um, of what the best ma method for training athletes is, um, different styles of conjugate, um, how I interpret the Olympic style approach is basically we've got four years with our athletes. So how can I progress them across the four years and how can we get them better every year rather than just having them express a stellar freshman season and then suddenly they trail off into oblivion for the most part. Um, some off-season and in-season comparisons. Um, the results of what I've done across the 18-19 season and then um, just the applications of that, as I mentioned. So my brief background, um, Bachelor of Science from St. Joseph's, um, no longer in existence, unfortunately, but um, got my bachelor's from there in 2011. Um, I'm ASCA Level 2 certified, so that was kind of um, my go-to. As you can obviously tell, I'm not from around here, so I kind of um, utilised that, that aspect with the ASCA. Um, Australian Weightlifting Federation in 2016, and then the NSCA in two, uh, 2016, and I'm currently um, under a graduate pro program with Liberty University for my, my Master of Human Performance. Um, brief background. Now, with me, um, I really haven't done any internships or assistant roles. Somehow I fell into um, the Director of Sports Performance at Hanover. Um, be careful what you wish for. You, you ask people... Um, who's willing to let you work for them when you volunteer. Surprisingly, everyone says yes. Um, so 23 sports decided to let me volunteer for them. Um, and that's kind of my, my private sector background that's, that's transitioned into uh, the current position that I am now. So I started off with women's basketball only um, and then a little bit of men's soccer and then kind of just was working with them little by little and, and word got out. So I, I kind of emphasised what I could do for the teams. Um, my benefit was that Hanover had not had really anyone focus on all 23 teams before I got there. Um, and I was just dumb enough to say, yes, I want to work with all 23 teams. So now, again, 500 athletes, which I enjoy. I enjoy every team I work with. There's really no teams that I can sort of say they're a pain to, to sort of be around, uh, which is a benefit to me. Okay, so now that I've got through the, the random stuff, so what, what is the best periodization for athletes? Um, Verkashansky, um, it's defined as the long-term cyclic structure um, around training and, and practice to maximise performance. So does that mean that the conjugate system is the best approach? Absolutely not. But for me, in my setting, um, that's what I've found works best. So obviously we've got the argument of linear versus non-linear. We've got... Um, the, the conjugate, which is what I'm going to speak about now. Now, we have two different versions of that. We have your block periodization and we have your west side conjugate that most people seem to be fairly familiar with. Um, different methods such as triphasic, the 531, um, Joe Ken's tier system, uh, the, the, CrossFit, um, the CrossFit realm, high intensity training. We've got a whole bunch of different methods that can be used, that coaches use, that they enjoy um, building their athletes in a certain realm and you find your method that, that works best for you. Okay, so brief background on Dr. Verkashansky. Um, he was a Russian sports scientist, track and field coach, um, specifically jumps. Um, so basically his, his methods were directed toward track and field. Um, it was known as the concurrent system um, that, that he early um, developed on that. Um, and his basis of his programs were, were jumping, um, which we now know as plyometrics. Now, with Verkashansky's jump methods, um, you guys may have heard of the shock method. He was primarily focused on depth drops, okay? How high can we drop the athlete from X height down, impact the ground to then get that explosion back up? Okay, um, with those, he would move from an unweighted to a barbell to a kettlebell, um, sorry, to a kettlebell to a barbell, and then into counter movement jumps. So the, the overall method of his, or the, the purpose behind his jump um, system was to develop the athlete's ability to handle the forces required um, in track and field. 
So if they're going to need to apply force rapidly, he was able to do that with, with the depth drops and that sort of thing. So similar to what you'll see next, um, he had two different phases. He had the accumulation block, and that's typically what we would know as, as your athlete's uh, building capacity. So can your athlete handle the workload um, that they're required from their sport coach? The, the second block is closer to the specific requirements of the sport, so the motor qualities that you want to develop. So are you in a jumping sport? Are you in an overhead sport? Are you in cross country? Are you in volleyball? Obviously two, two very different parameters and, and multiple different qualities that each sport needs. Okay, so in contrast to that, we've, we're looking at now the west side version. Um, the west side version, you have your max effort days, your dynamic effort days. Um, for the most part, what you're looking at is a heavy single rep. On your max effort days, you're looking at potentially a training PR. Um, one thing I found a lot of people make the mistake of is they think it's a lifetime PR. So every time you go into the weight room, let's hit a lifetime PR. So just a brief story, I had a few guys dabbling in this, this program when I, I turned up to Hanover. And their, their frustration was there when they're trying to trap by deadlift 405. And they've gone for it two or three weeks in a row. And I said, so have you ever hit 405? And they said, no. So I said, you're going for this, this weight that you've never experienced before. And you're trying to implement the same stimulus each week. So they're jumping from 350 to 405, 355 to 405 every week consistently without trying to, to vary up those movements and, and change up the patterns that they're using. So I work with, with very similar um, parameters in, in terms of the five pound plan. And again, you'll see that coming up, um, five pounds a month. If I can get them up five pounds a month, um, as Louis Simmons says, that's 60 pounds a year, okay? If you're increasing your max of 60 pounds a year, you, you're a pretty happy athlete, okay? If I can take my squat from 200 to 260, 300, 360, whatever it is, um, you, you know your athlete's getting stronger. Um, your max effort day, we're looking at strength speed, okay? Moving heavy weights as fast as possible, um, whereas on your other side, we're looking at speed strength, okay? Moving the lighter weights at maximal speed. Now, um, we're looking at different waves. Now, with the band and chain, obviously not available to everyone. Um, I'm lucky enough that we're, we're experiencing a... Uh, a weight room renovation, i.e. Like, like Manchester, that sort of thing. So I will have access to bands and chains from there, but I'll kind of show you how we can vary that up if you don't have access to those, those different things. Um, within both of these days, you, you're looking at two times per week, you're looking at 40 jumps total, okay? So if you're doing 40 um, on your max effort day, that could potentially be for a warm up. that could be in terms of French contrast, with your, your heavy squats, um, so go a heavy weight to an explosive movement. Um, or in your dynamic day, that could be um, some sort of warm up, some sort of explosive movement, some sort of explosive repetition um, that we just get the central nervous system fired up for that day. Um, one thing that we just recently got at Hanover, and, and many of you may have experienced this, is the, the push technology, um, train with push. Um, so that allows me sort of a little bit of the velocity the velocity-based um, meters per second, um, force peak power, that sort of thing. Um, so on my max effort day, I want them to move the bar at about 0.7 meters per second. Now, this is a little bit faster than what the typical conjugate would, would like to go with, um, but I find the technical ability of my athletes requires me to get them to back off that weight um, so that we can move it a little bit faster, a little bit, little bit higher quality with that. Whereas with my dynamic effort days, let's move it. Let's move it at 1.1, 1.3 um, to get it the speed of the movement, but also teaching them that it's not always a heavy day when you go into the weight room. Okay, so the purpose of the program. Um, for the, the first three phases, okay, and I typically get through three phases in an off season, um, no failed reps. I do not want you to fail a rep. Now, that may seem counterintuitive to, to some, um, 
But again, when it comes to our sport, we're not looking to fail. A missed shot, uh, uh, a slower time in a pool, something like that. We're not looking to, to perform subpar when it comes to our athletic events. So why would we do that in the weight room? Um, my freshman, so I'm just one guy, um, but I try as much as I can to individualize it. So I don't want my freshman to come in trying to throw up the biggest weight they can to, to prove a point to my, my upper class, uh, upperclassmen. Um, we want them to refine the movements and we want to get you proficient at jumping and landing, okay? Um, very similar to what, what Coach Palmer has said um, in his, his talk before, um, the sprinting, the jumping, very big components of what we do in all sports. Um, so we want to move the weights as if you were sprinting, jumping, throwing, that sort of thing. By doing that, we create that higher resilience, that higher resistance to injury. Um, we're now looking at the, the development of the tendons and the ligaments rather than just the muscle itself. So my easiest metaphor that I use with my athletes is where we've got an F-150 looking at me and we've got a Toyota Prius engine in it. Nothing, nothing wrong with the Toyota Prius. They're efficient. But at some point trying to run an F-150 with a Prius engine, it's, it's going to crap out. Okay, so you want to try and develop that F-150 engine within that F-150 body, okay? Um, so it's the, the biggest thing that I've had to deal with is the buy-in, okay? Coach, when are we maxing out? Coach, when are we maxing out? There is an extended period of time. I typically won't max out for at least 16 weeks, okay? We start the semester, we finish the semester if we've had a good progressive run on the program. If we haven't, then what I want the athletes to understand is the weights they're moving to be more efficient. So if you've never hit a 315 squat or you're looking to jump in your max test, if we can get you more comfortable with those heavier weights that at any given day you can come in and move a 275, a 285, a 295 with good technique, with good form, we are getting you stronger. We're just not jumping into that one rep, that one time, that, that big lift that, again, I'm sure you guys can attest, it's, coach, I'm feeling a little tweak in the low back. I'm feeling a little twinge in my shoulder. I'm feeling all these different things that come about from that, that one rep max test. Um, and then the main point that I want to I make with this one is the physical versus mental. So you'll see in some of the different um, sessions that we do, is it a case of you're physically unable to do it or are you just mentally not quite tough enough to get there as yet? So um, what wins out in that case? And, and um, as Coach Rodolfi spoke about, um, are they the, the worker that comes in and, and pushes hard or are they the worker that finds that, that reason why they can't train? Okay, so just a little, little contrast between the off-season and in-season. Um, we're looking at force absorption, the progressive um, ability to develop a force, okay? The more force, the more powerful, um, the more explosive the ath athlete can be. Now, in the off-season, my goal is to always make sure that the athletes are as familiar with as many different lifts as possible. Because when we get in-season, there's no shock. There's no, well, coach, we haven't done that, that movement before suddenly you're spending 45 minutes trying to coach a, a, a front squat, a back squat, a box squat, um, something they've never seen the mechanics to and don't understand. So now you're wasting maybe one, two, three sessions a week trying to get them comfortable with that movement to start, start adding weight to that. We develop their capacities, um, anaerobic, aerobic, muscle endurance, um, really try and jack up the volume, okay? Um, now, as... I think we saw back here, I forgot to mention, 20% barbell movements, 80% accessories. So I want to get them very, very high quality, very, very low quantity under a barbell. External rotation of the shoulder, load on the spine. If we can minimize that and jack up all the accessories where they're not loading directly down on their spine, they're not having to put their shoulder into compromising positions, we can get a lot more efficiency out of the movements that we're, that we're doing. Um, so from there, they understand the techniques. They understand the positions. You can 
spend a little bit more time getting the freshmen knowing what they're doing. You can spend a little bit more time telling the upperclassmen, we need you to be perfect with your technique. As we move in season, this is where we work on things like I, I mentioned with the heavy to light, the post activation or the post satanic uh, potentiation. And, and basically, um, what do you need individually to succeed at that next meet? Is it conference? Is it just a regular, is it just a regular home meet? Is it nationals? Is it regionals? So is it your last chance meet? What I have, I have athletes that love to squat heavy the day before a meet. I have athletes who are somewhat precious and they don't like doing anything the Wednesday before. Three, four days out, they need to back right off. So I need to find for each of them what they need and individualize the program so that they're as successful as possible. Um, within this, this time period in season, we do more of your traditional dynamic effort, max effort days. Um, dynamic effort at the beginning of the week, get them fired up. They're a little bit dusty from the weekend. We move a, a lighter weight um, with a, a greater speed, so we may not be hitting that 1.3 meters per second, or we may not move it as well, but we can at least control what they're doing, that they're not, let's say they go out for a big weekend, I'm not expecting them to come in lifting max weight when they're not 100% nutritionally there. Um, purpose of this program in season is to systematically decrease their time that they're in the weight room. More work, less time, greater efficiency. Okay, so here's where we get into your Olympics um, style approach. So what I'm trying to do at Hanover is develop a culture, okay? As I said, before I got in there, you had your football team lift, you had your basketball team lift. Basketball loves a bit of bench press bicep. Football loves a bit of bench press bicep. So it's kind of that, that crossover of what can I do to still give you what you want in the weight room. We're still 20, 21, 19, 20, 21 year old guys. We still want to be beefed up. But how can I then transition that so that you're going to be an effective athlete as well? So year one. You've got to understand it. What are we trying to do? What are you coming in? Are you coming in saying, well, I'm D3. I just have to, I have to do this because mum and dad want me to. Well, technically you don't. I mean, they're not receiving money. You choose to play the sport because you want to play the sport. Why not invest? Why not be good at what you're doing? Okay. Um, within that, we give them a little bit of foresight. What, what, do, you want to, what do you want to do by your senior year? Um, we want to work backward from their senior year i.e. we want to work backward from, say, the Olympics back to where they're, they're looking at um, what they're doing this year and how that's going to develop and build them into their senior year. Um, so to determine the success, we're, we're looking at your own goals, okay? Don't compare yourself as a freshman to that senior that's been a two-year All-American or that senior that finished fifth in the country. We want you to develop the goals knowing what your capabilities are and to push you to the top of your capabilities. The goal don't have to be just weight room or performance based. Be, be an exceptional individual as well as what you are in the weight room. Now, again, I've, it's taken some time, but I've got athletes now understanding that the reasons why I'm putting them through different things in the weight room is to get them a, a greater level of discipline, organization, and just overall work ethic to succeed in the real world, okay? Um, from there, a successful freshman year, we've, we've got them to understand what we're doing. We move them into the investment, okay? You've been through a year of this. You've bought in, you may have not bought in, but are you willing to invest in what that culture is? So now you start taking from, from sophomore year you're now taking a bit more of a leadership role. Guide the freshmen. You don't have to coach them, you don't have to teach them, but be a good role model for the freshmen, freshmen coming in. And then we now see those freshman goals you, you set last year, where are we in relation to them? Where are we in relation to your senior year? How are we looking to um, get to those goals? Are we still way off or are we starting to close in on them? Year three, 
okay? You're representing my culture now, okay? And I, I focus on this one most is because this will be the start of my third year at Hanover, okay? So what do you hold every session to make sure that you're representing Hanover, Hanover sports performance and Hanover's culture to the best of your ability, okay? Are you my silent achiever? Are you coming in, you don't say a word to anyone else, and you just get your work done? I've got those athletes, you are fine doing that. Are you the, the upperclassman that's gonna hold your freshman accountable? When a freshman turns up at 6.05 and we start our lift at six, is that acceptable? Is that acceptable for what we want in our culture? When your freshmen are coming in, not motivated to lift, are you saying, well, they're in a horrible mood today and leave them be? Or are you trying to change their, their motivation for that day? And obviously that comes down to me, number one, but when I, I can present that to my upperclassmen, that then floods into my, uh, my upperclassmen as well. Uh, sorry, my, my freshmen as well. Um, establish your personalities and aim for, aim for the top level of performance. Don't be satisfied with, we're D3, let's just win conference. Or let's be, let's be top two in conference, okay? Aim for that top level possible. Senior season, okay? Teach it. Teach the culture you've learned in four years, okay? If you know what you're doing, if you know that you're right on the cusp of achieving those goals, if you know that everything you're doing in the weight room up until now has led to the success that you're now at, are you a national level qualifier this year? Are you a regional level qualifier this year? Now, I'm, I'm under no false pretenses that all of my athletes are going to be national level qualifiers. But if you can leave your collegiate career saying, I was all conference, I'm stoked with being all conference, then that's excellent because I know that you've pushed yourself to that point. If they're like, well, I could have made nationals, but I was just, I'm happy with conference, that's not good enough. We want, it, we want to change that perception, change that mentality and, and build that mindset that the top level of performance is what's accepted. Um, by, by fourth year, you're fully invested in the culture. Um, you've developed the standard you want to set um, and, and you flood that through not only your performance sessions, but on campus, in your studies, outside of the realm of the weight room that transitions into everything you've done. Okay, so a brief look at what we've, what we've got for um, the max effort day. So our phase one, here's where I've, I've modified it. And I forgot to sort of say at the beginning, this is a, my disclaimer, is I'm just tampering around with different methods with the conjugate system, okay? Um, as I said, they work for me. If you guys look at this and say, this would not work for me, it looks like a horrible program, I would love to chat and, and find out some different methods you guys are doing. Um, with the first, with phase one, phase one, method one. This is minimal resources, okay? So right now, I can say at Hanover, we are not the lowest level of resource, but we have minimal resources, okay? So we're only gonna do two different lifts a, a month, okay? So each, each block, each phase is four weeks long, okay, one month. That first two weeks, you're gonna go the same lift. Let's say it's a back squat. You're gonna work, you're gonna build to an 80%. That's your one rep max, okay? We're, the second week, we're gonna build you to an 85%, okay? Still extremely high quality in the movement, but we're looking to increase you from that week before, okay? Now, you'll see again, further along, when I test, I have a test week, week one, we do six different lifts. We do two squats, two bench, um, one overhead press, one deadlift variation, okay? From that, we're taking these singles, okay? So once you've tested, we kind of utilize them for our numbers, but that 80 and 85% become your one rep max, if that makes sense, okay? And I can explain that a little bit more. Method two is if you have the resources. Do you have bands? Do you have chains? Do you have a variety of blocks or plates or boxes? that you can do different level deadlifts, you can do different level squats, you can, you can front squat, back squat, chain squat, band squat, all that sort of thing. And we're going 85% for four weeks. Every lift, 
is different each week, but you're 85%. So that front squat might be 245. That box squat might be 285. That front squat with band might be 215. So we're, we're working on different, different aspects of that to make sure that that 85% is the weight you need to hit. As we move into phase two, we look to increase that, okay? So we're now jumping anywhere seven to 10%, but that movement is still, hypothetically, about 80% of our true 1RM, because I do not want you, when you test, to be that knee-shaking, three Red Bull, 12 hours of sleep max. I want it to be an any day of the week max. So we now jump two different lifts, Method one, okay, we're still using the back squat again and the front squat, say for example, you're gonna go 87 the first week and you're gonna give me a smooth 90. And you're gonna go, whoa, that 90 moved very, very well. So now we start to get a little bit more momentum, a little bit more buy-in that that 90% doesn't feel like death. It now is, is becoming a natural part of the, the numbers that you're doing for that, that program. Method two, we move, different lift, can you go up to your 90% in that week, okay? 85 moved pretty well, I'm gonna go up to 90% for my banded back squat this week or my banded front squat. 85 moved all right, but I think I may only go up five pounds. Great, we're up five pounds. Let's, let's work with 87%. So now that's where we start to get a little bit of a shift to those that know their movements and those that are not quite as familiar with their movements that we can just get understanding what we're trying to do. All right, so now we back off a little bit with the freshmen, okay? We make sure that with their, um, their phase three, that we have them doing two different lifts. We're, we're working on some form of hip extension and vertical press. Now, with this one, this is all I'm doing with, with, my, um, with my freshmen for phase three. I keep them within that 80 to 85% range, but then try and move them into potentially a different lift each week if they start to get the confidence to do that, okay? So we kind of fluctuate between singles, and now we're starting to move in for phase three. You'll see where the rep ranges differ. It's not just a, an 80 to 85, 87 to 90. Well, now we're back to 80, 80 to 85, okay? There's a reason why we drop back to the 80 to 85%. If they know what they're doing, suddenly we get to the 85%, different lifts. Now you're starting to get an understanding of so many different variations of where your feet need to be, where your, where your shoulders need to be, where your chest needs to be, how your knees need to move. And we start to get them to understand that each part of the, the squat, each part of the deadlift, each part of the bench press can now influence that main lift, that one rep max test. For my upperclassmen, okay? So what we're now looking at is we now start to hit eight weeks, okay? So we've hit that eight week mark. We wanna leave one to three reps in the tank, okay? So with my um, freshmen, we're working on deadlifts, okay? One rep with one to three in the tank. Okay, we now start to increase some of my, my freshmen. I will look to um, manually increase their max that they've never done before, but we can fluctuate their, their numbers from there. With my upperclassmen, we're going eight, six, four, four. They're going progressively increasing each week that by the time they hit that four, they're at 85%. By the time they hit week four, they're hitting a four, for roughly their 95%, okay? Does that make sense to everyone? So we're looking at increasing that. Now, if we go for a four, a four rep in week four and we fail it, so be it. That's where we've now, we've grooved the patterns. We've got up to 10, 11 weeks worth of, of, of programming in there. And then we start to, to fluctuate with that, that final few weeks before we test uh, where you wanna be on your squat and what those potential numbers are. Okay, so with our dynamic effort day, this is where I've sort of added in a little bit of hypertrophy. Um, so we go a little bit of German volume training with this one. Okay, so we've got, 
we've got um, six to eight sets, eight reps, 60, 65, and 75 percent. So again, roughly that first two weeks, we're about five to 10 percent shy of what you can do for eight reps. 75 percent for some, eight may be pretty smooth. 75 percent for others may be starting to push a little bit tough on that eight by eight. All of these programs I've done before my athletes do them. They suck, they're a little bit rough to do, but they're doable, okay? Um, so that's what I want to express to them. When they say, six by eight, coach, that seems impossible. I typically give them enough rest. We typically only give them about 90 seconds to two minutes, but to me, that was enough rest to get back in after I've done my first 10, 11, 12 weeks. Um, we, we start to become comfortable with moving these different, different weights um, for higher volumes. So within this dynamic effort day, we're looking at athlete capacity, we're looking at good technical patterns, and we're, we're getting them to understand that they're getting stronger because they're moving moderate to heavy weights frequently rather than moving a heavy weight infrequently, okay? Um, we go front squat to a back squat, okay? So we're going front squat with a bench, bench press block. So again, modifications of bench press into a back squat and a vertical pull, okay? So opposite to what we want to do for our bench, we're still trying to get those scaps, those, those scapulars, the, the shoulders still in good functional ranges of motion. If I'm having them bench for 12 weeks straight, I find that shoulders just become absolutely fried and they become pretty much useless. Um, we're, main, main purpose of these, these um, dynamic days is just higher quality movements. Get your athlete to make every rep look, even if they're slower, make them look crisp, clean, no knees are touching, no heads dipping forward, no asses sticking up. You wanna make sure that they're doing it with good technical form. And then um, the off season, so for, for phase three, we work on front squats, but we start to get them ready for that three rep, that true dynamic phase, okay? So 50, 55, 60, 65%, potentially with band, potentially with chain, potentially not with either, um, but basically making sure 60 seconds, dropping that rest to 45 seconds, dropping that rest to 30 seconds, can they replicate Three reps, rest, three reps, rest, three reps, rest. And again, building that capacity to work with high speeds and good quality, okay? Uh, the push technology allows me to also say to them that if they're moving that weight extremely poorly, let's drop you back. I don't care what weight you're using. Let's get you at a meter per second. Let's get you at 1.1 meters per second. So now. They're none the wiser what's on the bar. And again, it's amazing how someone can see a weight and then switch off directly when you say focus on this number rather than this number. So if I have a, an athlete that starts to, to fatigue pretty quick, I can say to them, let's get 135 on the bar, but I want you to move that at 1.1. And suddenly they're moving it at 1.1. It's 20 pounds slower, but their intent to move it is still there. Okay, in season. So we're going regen day on a Monday, as I mentioned. The, the, the kids come back from a big weekend. The, the movements are focused on, and it's a shorter lift, okay? Three to five reps in your dynamic, upper and lower on the same day. Um, we're looking for the accommodating resistance. So again, as I said, the bands and chains. Um, we still get our jumps in. We still get the two 40, 40 jumps a week. Um, so 40 in the, the Monday session and then we'll get 40 in the Thursday session. Um, as we move into your day two and three, it's modified max effort. So we, we will typically go, and again, I allow them to decide if they wanna do max effort lower on Wednesday for my superstitious competitors, do they wanna come in and squat so that they've got max amount of time before their event or do they want to go Thursday? We're leaving on a Friday. They're, they've squat the last physical day before they can go into their meet. They feel good. They've moved a heavy weight. They start to, to feel a little bit more confident with that. Um, still working with the, the PAP, the French contrast. So again, 
a, a workout in season may look like a heavy squat. Again, nothing revolutionary. A heavy squat, some sort of weighted squat jump into an accelerated jump or into a body weight jump and then an accelerated jump, something like that, to just get that post-activation potentiation in each of the, in each of the athletes. Um, in season, we, we focus on a much more RPE-based system. So how are you feeling today? Okay, we're going to have those athletes that can walk in after a big five-event day and coach them at a two. I'm good. I can have someone throw three, three throws and not make finals, and they're at a nine. How that happens, I don't know. But sometimes you have those athletes. Now, this is the biggest thing too. What's weak? What, what are you struggling with? When you throw, when you jump, when you sprint, what is holding you back? Is it a lumbar issue? Is it a glute issue? Is it a quad issue? Is it a hamstring issue? So that's where across those four years, we get you to understand what is individual and what do you need personally to improve your performance. Just because one of the throwers needs glute work doesn't mean, or a, a thrower needs bicep work, doesn't mean every single one of us needs to be over at the curl rack trying to, to barbell curl to get bigger biceps. If bicep, bicep tendon, tricep tendon is what they need to develop, then that may be your accessories. If glutes and hamstrings, they're not as pretty as what the biceps and triceps are, but glutes and hamstrings may be what you need. Go and focus on that first, and if you want a little party pump at the end, then get that in afterwards, that's fine. Um, this is where we really keep we really keep the low volume, okay? I do not want you under a barbell any more than the necessary reps. And then we just go the 80% for your accessories. Um, that just there just gives you a little bit of an idea of our, our off season, okay? Um, so basically shows you where we've got our testing and then assuming that everything's gone to plan, um, we vary it up within those, those different blocks. Now, one thing I made the mistake of my first year is giving them deload weeks. They've got enough breaks through the semester that I just now structure my program. Fall break, deload. Thanksgiving break, deload. So rather than having the week before fall break, let's, let's give you deload. Suddenly it's the week before fall break, fall break, and then we're spending another week getting into it. Or Thanksgiving break, the week before Thanksgiving break, suddenly we've got one week for Christmas, and then we're getting back into it. We've lost up to four or five weeks on, on those breaks. Um, so they've, I've set up the program so that we get structured breaks in between each of those. And then that's just what our, our um, in-season will look like. We'll, we'll look for some modifications potentially across the summer, um, or sorry, across the Christmas period, um, throwing in some one by 20s um, just to keep them fresh, but deload them back a little bit from, from the main movements, get them a little bit more familiar with um, squat patterns again that they may have shifted away from slightly um, as we finish up with exams and things like that. Um, and then that progresses us through to the Summer Olympics. Um, national meet prep, making sure that what we've done gets them as ready for last chance meets, for national meets, for regional meets, um, winning conference, whatever it may be. We want to make sure that, that they're as primed as possible um, for those different events. Okay. So 17, 18, 18, 19. So I've highlighted a few different things on here. Um, again, I want to emphasize maybe pure luck, um, but we have had some very, very good results in terms of what we've done the 18, 19 season um, comparatively to me getting them from February to April in season in the 17 and 18 track and field season. So um, one academic All-American, um, to five, um, we jumped from 105 conference points uh, to 152 in 2019. So this was the highest we'd ever finished since like 1984. Um, we had 12 top five all-time marks, um, and that was top five. So we had 53 um, top 10 all-time marks in the 2018-19 the season. Um, 10 total school records, um, from the, the indoor and outdoor season combined, we had 12 just in outdoor. Um, so as I said, just the implementation now, could that be the implementation of a strength program for them? 100%. My dictating year will be this year. The 1920 season 
is it actually successful? And, or am I just blowing smoke and I got lucky because they're all just getting stronger? At the end of the day, if they're getting stronger, they're going to perform better. If they're moving more efficiently, they're going to perform better. Okay, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Um, I started off trying to do that. I started off trying to think every session had to be different and fun and exciting and what BOSU ball banded cleans can I do? And, and that just became too much of a task because at the end of the day, they don't know how to squat. They don't know how to deadlift. So why am I trying to get them funky and fancy with the lack of equipment that I have and the fact that I can make those sessions what I want them to be based on how I turn up to the session. They're amped for a back squat if I'm amped for a back squat. They're over a back squat if I'm over a back squat. So as long as I come in with that, that infectious energy, we're going to have one hell of a session. As I sort of started mentioning before, further applications. So the main movements stay the same, okay? We keep varying them up, but the concept of what you want to achieve from, from them stays the same. Football, we're going we're gonna to vary up the different movements that they need. Maybe O-line needs a box squat to develop hip strength. Deadlifts, they didn't know what to do when I threw in deadlifts because for some reason football players despise deadlifts. At Hanover anyway, I'll, I'll just game that. Um, but basically, baseball players, again, we need hips, we need lower limb, but now we focus our accessories potentially on rotation. If rotation's not something you do, maybe we vary up the accessories again. Basketball, soccer, volleyball, we work on the main movement staying the same, okay, the concept of the main movement staying the same with those variations, and we develop the accessories for what they need in their, their particular, the qualities that they need for their particular sport. Um, YouTube channel, still iffy. I've got a wicked coma over in the YouTube channel, so maybe ignore that. Um, but my Facebook, Instagram, um, Instagram, the Iron Panthers. Um, so I've kind of thrown that on. I know many, many different colleges and high schools have the Iron something. Um, so um, their Instagram, if you're interested, that's my cell, email. Um, if you want the presentation at all, uh, by all means, shoot me a text, give me a call, shoot me an email. Um, you're more than welcome to come down. I'm trying to organize something for Squattober, if anyone's interested in that, when we get our renovation. Um, just a little bit of camaraderie. Um, I've kind of learned now that coaches around, you, if you dive a little bit deeper, it doesn't have to be kind of the name on the shirt. Um, I enjoy catching up with coaches who genuinely just want to shoot the shit, talk shop, um, and learn something from each other. And I find that when I do that, I learn a whole, a whole lot more than trying to chase that, that big that big name on a, on a shirt. Just the resources that I use. So if you're interested in that, I can send you the, the links to any of those. Um, and finally, I just want to thank Coach Ramos. Um, thanks for having me. As he mentioned, um, we're strength and conditioning coaches. Our athletes compete against each other, but at the same time, our ultimate goal is what's the highest level of performance with the lowest chances of injury that we can, we can get um, from our athletes. So at the end of the day, I don't wish ill upon his athletes getting injured, of course, so why am I going to have any sort of disdain between sort of a strength and conditioning coach? I'm not a, a basketball coach that has a rivalry. I'm not a, a football coach or anything like that. So I really do enjoy times like this, and I appreciate you guys um, coming in and, and sort of watching the talk. Hopefully uh, you guys took some, some decent tidbits from it. Um, and just the, the NSCA, um, obviously setting this up for us um, with Coach Ramos um, and getting you guys some, some education out of it as well. And uh, that's it. Thanks, guys. Uh, any questions? I guess I should have asked. If not, if I'm out of time, I'm not sure. Maybe. Nope. Sweet. Thank you.